good afternoon. It is the 23rd of March, 2021, and I was going to do one on uh, college and transitioning from college to law enforcement, specifically federal law enforcement, but I just saw something in the news that uh, is very timely. I get a lot of questions about it. I think it's a big concern for people going into law enforcement, and that is drug abuse, prior drug abuse, and law enforcement. And what brought this to my attention really, or brought it again to my attention was just that a news report came out a couple days ago that indicated that President Biden dismissed a number of White House staffers because of admissions of marijuana use on their SF-86, which if you don't know what that is, it's basically a, uh, it's a background investigation form that you fill out whenever you're trying to get a security clearance. Now, someone I know uh, who's in a position to know said that Actually, what happened is most of them failed the urinalysis test, which could be true. I really don't know. You know, I'm not there. But he did remove a number of people uh, from the White House staff. So first, what I'm going to talk about is just my ideas in general. I mean, when I joined law enforcement, uh, federal law enforcement, 1985, President Reagan was the president. And the standard was, you know, zero tolerance. Uh, any drug use knocked you out. So if you'd ever used marijuana, cocaine, anything like that, you're automatically disqualified for good. Uh, now, that was, of course, at a different time in our history, okay, 1985, very different. Now, since that's happened, you know, if we look at the different presidents who've been in office, you know, um, I don't think, you know, President Biden has probably ever used drugs. I really have no idea. I think his son has, but I don't think he has. I don't think Donald Trump ever used drugs. Uh, a lot of people don't like him. You either like him or you don't like him. But he probably never used illegal drugs. President Obama, I think he used illegal drugs. President George W. Bush, I'm pretty certain he used illegal drugs. I don't know, but at one point in his life, not when he was president, of course. Same thing applies to Obama, not when he was president before. President Clinton, I'm pretty sure that he used illegal drugs. Uh, and then you get back to President George H.W. Bush, but again, that's a different generation. That's the World War II generation. So, uh, well, like for instance, like with President Clinton or President George W. Bush or President Obama, you could even have a situation where commanders in chief would not qualify to enter the basic level of federal law enforcement. They wouldn't even qualify to be their own bodyguards. Uh, and you have to be aware that there are two types of positions in the federal government, right? There's the political appointee, uh, and then there are career appointees, uh, which is what, you know, this channel is mostly focused on, career appointment to the federal government and law enforcement. Political appointees are appointed by the president, uh, and a background investigation is conducted on them by the FBI. So if you're going to be the head of an agency, a cabinet officer, head of an agency, work in the White House staff, federal judge, anything that's appointed by the president, the Bureau does an investigation, that information goes to the White House counsel and the president can decide whether or not to give you a clearance. The FBI does not adjudicate background investigation findings on political appointees because the president has plenary authority that means unlimited authority to appoint who he wants. Some of them require Senate confirmation, some do not. Uh, so again, the Bureau does not adjudicate. They just do the investigation. Now with career appointees, such as what I was, such as you know the vast majority of people who work for the United States government, especially in law enforcement, the agencies have regulations with regards to prior drug use. And here's what I think on it. You know, number one, um, now, obviously, going into law enforcement, going into the military, you're going to be a warrior, okay? And that applies even when you retire, okay? You're going to be carrying a weapon all the time, okay? And so that requires alertness and physical fitness. If you're not alert mentally, if you're not physically fit, you shouldn't be carrying a weapon, okay? In my humble opinion. Um, this applies to police, applies to federal agents, applies to anybody in that mindset. Now, I'm 61 years old. I'm retired from the, the DEA, but, you know, I still qualify with my weapon several times a year. I carry my weapon under the Federal Law Enforcement uh, Safety Act for retired agents. 
And, you know, as such, I do not use intoxicants. I don't get drunk. <laughs> I don't certainly never don't use illegal drugs. And uh, I try to keep myself as physically fit as I can. Yesterday I ran seven miles and then I walked another six. So I try to, you know, try to keep my weight down, try to stay as physically fit as I can. And that's really the mindset and the lifestyle that you are moving toward if you want to go into federal law enforcement. So you're going to be in a position, or law enforcement in general, where you're carrying a weapon, okay? You have to be mentally alert. Number two, you have to be physically fit, okay? Uh, those are two requirements, like it or not. So my opinion, you know, if a person uses drugs, you know, if an applicant came to me and, you know, the first question is, do you use illegal drugs? And if the answer is yes, then they can't get in. Now, if the answer is that they had used drugs in the past when they were a kid, let's say in high school or something, or maybe in, in college or something, when they were not in a position of trust, I would let that go provided they've learned their lesson and they don't do it now. Okay? So that would be my take on it. But what we're going to do is look at each of the agency standards, the Justice Department standards, the Capitol Police standards, the Secret Service standards, and Customs and Border Protection. Now, with regards to state and local, each one has its own requirements. Okay, so let's let's do that right now. The Justice Department has probably the most restrictive uh, drug policy uh, with regards to applicants, and this would apply to the FBI, DEA, ATF, United States Marshals. It also applies to the Capitol Police, even though they're not part of the Justice Department. And uh, basically, this is taken from the DEA website, but it's pretty much the same in all of those agencies, any Justice Department agency, and also for whatever reason, the Capitol Police have uh, seemed to have borrowed this uh, drug standard. And basically, the, the requirement is uh, there cannot be any use of marijuana or anything containing marijuana within three years preceding the date of the application for employment and that includes cannabis, hash, hash oil, THC in both synthetic and natural forms. And this would apply of course to even to states where drug use or marijuana use is, and I'm putting in quotation marks, legal. And the date uh, would be the date required the three years is the date of the job announcement. So in this case, the job announcement was issued the 15th of March, 2021. So you just go back three years, 2019, 2018, you know, so from March 15th, 2018 to this date, if there's been any use of marijuana during that time, that would disqualify you. Now, if the person was selling drugs, you know, <laughs> obviously that they're not going to uh, get hired. Um, if there was heavy drug use, okay, uh, they would not be hired. Uh, but, you know, I think it would be tend to be more isolated or experimental use. They don't have a number of times anymore. They used to have a number of times, and I think it was, it went from five to seven to ten times, and then they just said, well, uh, basically, uh, uh, you may have used drugs in the past, so long as it's really in the past and, you know, it wasn't a problem, and uh, there you go. So, three years. Now, any illegal drugs other than marijuana within 10 years preceding the date of the application for employment, so you'd have to go back to 2011, March 15, 2011, for anything other than marijuana. So, cocaine, heroin, and I'm sure any of that, if it's any more than an experimental one-time use, uh, you would definitely be disqualified. One would think that the policy for drug use would be roughly the same throughout all federal law enforcement, but the Department of Homeland Security has different standards, and each agency apparently has different standards. This is the drug policy statement for the United States Secret Service, and would apply to special agent applicants uh, protective service applicants, as well as uniform division. And basically with regards to marijuana, it says that uh, if a person has used marijuana, and this includes cannabis, hash, oil, medical marijuana, tetrahydrocannabinol, in both synthetic and natural forms, 
there's basically a sliding scale. So if the person was age 24 or younger, um, then it would be the date of application for employment should be at least one year since the last use or purchase. So again, if your age is 24, let's say you're 25 and you're applying to the Secret Service, then you get one year, you know, because if you were 24 or younger when you last used the drug, uh, your date of employment application has to be one year. 25, it's two years. 26, it's three years. 27, it's four years. And 28, it's five years. So basically that uh, includes so-called medical marijuana in states where marijuana is lawful. Uh, it does not say how many times a person could have used the drug. It just says age when last used or purchased. So not current age. So again, um, you know, suppose the person is 24 and applying for a job. Well then your last use could not be more than a year ago. So today is, <laughs> the 22nd of March 2021 well, that would mean it would be the 22nd of March 2020 now again if you're 28 you know you'd have to go back five years so that would be you know, 2017 something like that and the same applies to older applicants and that's that with regards to drug use and this policy was revised on April of 2017 okay now with regards to it says here an applicant who has sold, distributed, or cultivated marijuana could still be eligible for employment. This is amazing. Uh, provided you did so without profit. Now selling drugs and selling marijuana is a felony under federal law. Now I was going to throw in my own two cents here. Anyone who sells drugs and doesn't make money off of it um, you know, is committing a felony and not making any money off of it. It's like robbing a bank and giving away the proceeds. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me anyway. But uh, it says here that if you sold it and didn't make a profit off of it, so long as you've done so more than 10 years ago, you'll be considered for employment. Okay, uh, And the same as distributing for recreational use. So, so long as it's more than 10 years since you've done that, um, you're good. Um, if it's less than 10 years, you're going to be disqualified. Steroids, it's five years. Um, so uh, there you go. And if you've ever sold, distributed, or manufactured steroids, you're out. Inhalants, uh, a whole bunch of different things. Paint thinners, <laughs> glue, gasoline, correction fluid, felt tip markers, everything that you can think of. Um, it has to be five years since the last use of inhalants. So um, hopefully you weren't doing that. Prescription drugs, and this only accounts for, only matters if the you don't have a prescription for it, obviously. If you have a prescription, you have your tooth pulled and they give you, you know, something to kill the pain. That's a totally different story. Nobody's referring to that. What they're referring to is drug use without a prescription. And, um, then basically, it, it, again, you have the same sort of thing. You have this, uh, I would call a sliding scale. If you were 24 or younger, it's one year, 25, two years, 26, three years, 27, four years, 28, five years. If you need more time, just lock on the screen and make it as big as you can. Please don't ask me, you know, if I use drugs when I was, you know, 25 and I'm 30. I don't, just look at this policy and this will, I can't answer it any better than this, okay? Uh, if you have a prolonged use of a drug without a prescription, regardless of whether it was used for its intended purpose, then it has to be five years. So prolonged use, I guess prolonged would be, you know, I don't know. Um, and then anyone who has ever sold or distributed prescription drugs could be eligible for employment as a Secret Service agent provided you didn't make money off of it and you did it more than 10 years ago. Now, you're not going to convince me that someone who was selling Xanax or OxyContin didn't make money off of it. There's the old saying, you know, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. But uh, but if you fall in that, in that category, well, it's 10 years, okay? 
Then they have hard drugs, and they consider that to be Schedule One, Schedule Two drugs, uh, which is includes amphetamines, crack, cocaine, heroin, LSD, MDMA, meth, PCP, but does not include marijuana, steroids, prescription drugs, or over-the-counter drugs. MDMA, ecstasy. Okay, uh, it has to be five years since the last use, and the person could never have sold, distributed, or manufactured ecstasy. Okay, cocaine. Um, the let's see here. Uh, other than crack cocaine, this is defined as other than crack cocaine, it has to be ten years from the last use or purchase, and you're ineligible if you've ever sold, distributed, or manufactured cocaine. What about drugs other than MDMA or cocaine? Okay. Uh, well, if it's crack cocaine or any other drug, you're out of luck. You're ineligible for employment uh, if you've ever sold it or used it. And then if you've ever used drugs in a public trust position, now that would be a police officer, probably a military officer, probably the military, they probably, probably count that too. Um, certainly any kind of uh, important job, well then that's going to be considered uh, a disqualifier. Okay? And if you used any drugs while holding a security clearance, um, well, you may be eligible, you may be eligible, but the following restrictions apply. If you were in a public trust position, it has to be 10 years, and um, yeah, so basically it, it's uh, for all intents and purposes, I think if you have a security clearance and you were using drugs, they're not going to hire you, okay? Okay, with regards to the Customs and Border Protection, um, so this would apply to CBP officers and Border Patrol agents, and um, that's different than the Secret Service. Uh, they do have guidelines, and it says if an applicant has used marijuana, steroids, or misused prescription drugs within the last two years, uh, then that's a disqualifier. And CBP guidelines also disqualify anyone who's used Schedule 1 through 5 drugs to include cocaine, methamphetamine, or heroin, which is misspelled, <laughs> misspelled on their website within three years prior to your application for work for Customs and Border Protection. Now, why would they have such a so-called liberal policy vis-a-vis -vis like the DEA or the FBI? And here is the answer to that one, okay? And the answer is quite simple. Um, it's that the Border Patrol has a hell of a time finding applicants. And that's about the easiest answer I can give. Uh, as of 2011, they were mandated by Congress to start polygraphing every applicant for the U.S. Border Patrol, and two out of three were failing. So this explains why they have more of a liberal policy. Uh, what is the purpose of the, the polygraph if you're taking people with? I think they're really, really, really concerned about people coming in who have ties to drug or alien smuggling organizations, you know, because that had become a major problem at some point, both with customs inspectors or CBP officers and with Border Patrol agents. They had a bad corruption problem when I was in El Paso, and which was in the 90s, it was a long time ago, but, uh, but they still did in the 2000s. In, the, in 2011, Congress cracked down, required them to take polygraphs, raised their pay, uh, but this is why the standards are, you know, basically is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, as lax as they are, you know, with, with this particular agency, because it's uh, hard to find applicants. And number two, you know, it's, um, it's not only hard to find applicants, they have a high turnover rate. Now it says here, does they have a set number of times in their answer is no, you know, they take into consideration uh, many things to determine the suitability of an applicant. And these include, not limited to, frequency and recency of use, circumstances, age of the person, societal conditions, likelihood of recurrence, <laughs> there better not be, and a demonstrate, demonstrated intent not to use illegal drugs in the future. Well, that's a good thing because they do, uh, 
in fact, give you your analysis, and if a person fails, they are removed. You know? Now, this is also interesting. Does speak seeking treatment or counseling for drug abuse automatically disqualify a person from Customs and Border Protection? And the answer is no. Now, this amazes me. This is amazing. Because if you're trying to enlist in the military, that is an absolute disqualifier. But here it says, no, uh, treatment is a positive step. So there you go. You know, they may yell at you and act like they're the Marines in the academy class, but their drug policies are not really, really all that uh, tough, uh, in my opinion. Should an applicant be honest? Yes. If you don't pass the polygraph, uh, you're down. And if they catch you on lying on a background investigation, it will not be tolerated. So there you go. Okay, so that's the policies with regards to drugs. Um, again, it differs from one agency to another, which is something I didn't know. I learned something today by looking at these standards. I didn't know that uh, CBP had as, um, I wouldn't say liberal, as lenient a policy as it has. Okay, it seems more lenient even than enlisting in the military. So, um, and that, that, you know, could be good because, again, you, they may be losing a lot of quality applicants who now understand that they did something wrong in the past and I'm all for that. I'm all for giving people, you know, other chances in life. Uh, what about alcohol abuse? Well, in my experience in DEA, alcohol abuse was a huge problem, particularly in the 1980s when I worked in Miami. Uh, it was looked, they looked the other way, uh, very much so. And uh, it reached a point where we literally had undercover agents who were loaded on the street, I mean drunken, while we're surveilling them. It's just really bad, really dangerous. These were guys who came on in the late 60s, and they came on when it was part of the DEA, it was not DEA, it was part of the Treasury Department, it was called the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. And you know, you have to go way back in time to the 30s when they formed that agency. It was part of Treasury, and they took the Treasury Enforcement Agent Test, but a lot of these older guys were alcoholics, unfortunately. Not a lot, but a significant number, senior 13s. And the, really the worst circumstance that I saw come out of alcohol abuse was a 1997 incident where an, a, a DE agent who had been in my group at one time in Miami uh, when I was a new agent, uh, killed another agent, drunken, uh, taking him home from a Christmas party in 1997. So he got 15 years in prison and the other agent died. And uh, after that, they really, really cracked down on it. In my experience, just about a lot of the internal affairs, what we call the OPR cases for a brief period of time, I worked in a fa uh, the Office of Professional Responsibility, which is OPR. Generally, agents get into trouble over the misuse of informants or alcohol-related incidents. That's when the agents got into trouble, drinking or misuse of, uh, misconduct with an informant. But drinking, you know, they, they end up pulling out their gun in a bar or something like that. Again, intoxicants and firearms, intoxicants and authority, intoxicants and in, in engaging in life and death operations, they don't go together. So uh, hopefully you've got something out of the video. Remember, you're going into a warrior, a law enforcement, which is you know the same as the military. It's a warrior mindset. You have to be in shape physically. You got to be in good mental shape. So God bless all of you. I hope this was helpful.